All right, good morning. good morning. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, yesterday, uh, the foundation class that I'm teaching, uh, with the assistance of Kathleen Noon, one of our practitioners, her uh, ministry here, or part of her ministry, is working with the labyrinth, which is a walking meditation. We went on this field trip to Forest Lawn in Glendale. I know, very exotic Glendale. Uh, we, we went all the way to Glendale to, to walk the labyrinth as a group. And it was a great experience, and then we went, we, we go to breakfast as our tradition, as part of the class. I mean, who doesn't love a field trip? Remember back when you were a kid in school and you weren't on a field trip? Our field trip is to a cemetery, what can I say? But it's a good thing. It's a good thing, it's really, really good. So I was uh, sharing with some of the people at, at the breakfast after that um, I was going to a baby shower, first baby shower I've ever been to. I, I didn't really know anything about a baby shower. And uh, uh, so they were, uh, they were giving me ideas about things that I might uh, bring as a gift for the baby. Great, okay, that's good. Now, you know, I noticed that when I go shopping, people tend to be in their own world. Have you noticed that? That people are, like, almost everybody else in the store is not there. However, the exception, I believe, is in the baby department. So I asked um, one woman, I said, you know, what do you think of this? And the next thing you know, I had a crowd. I did. <laughs> there were three women and all their kids all helping me select you know, talking about what's, uh, what's a good brand and what's a good fabric. And I was like, I don't know, it's, it's soft. It seems good to me. It's soft. I, what's what I know about it, you know? And no, not those. Those are too hard to get a baby into. Don't do that. And, and it's like, I was having such an education at the Target. It was incredible. But what was so funny is everything that people suggested at breakfast actually is what showed up at the Target. You know, and that shows me how powerful our mind always is. Now, I don't have to fully understand how it works, I just need to understand that it works. And what I believe this was a demonstration of is that I put something out into consciousness. I had an idea. And in fact, I had an idea about something I really didn't know much about. But what the universe did was the universe supplied the people who could fill in the gaps for me, and I left with a huge bag of stuff. It was so much fun. I, was, I mean, it really was. It was great. I figured, hey, when am I going to have this opportunity again, you know? So, so, so this was, um, I, I chalked Part of this up to um, us as spiritual students as we grow, what we want to do is we want to listen more to our heart. That's another way of saying trusting the still small voice within, trusting the voice of God, the voice of spirit, the voice of that infinite knowing that is within us, that we want to listen more and more and more to that as we continue to grow and evolve spiritually. Because what I come to understand is that the more I do that, the better off I am. You know, that, that when I listen to what I'm calling my heart this morning, when I listen to that, I'm never wrong. I never do the wrong thing. I never say, oh, I shouldn't have listened to my heart. I should have listened to my head. People talk about the difference between listening to their head and listening to their heart, and I think we all have some sense of, of what that is. But when I listen to my head, you know, it's that that logical, linear part of my mind that so often wants to talk me out of doing the right thing is what it does, I think, you know? In A Course in Miracles, it talks about the voice of the ego, the small separate self, always speaks first and it speaks loudest, you know? So, you know, the voice of God within us, the still small voice, the voice of our heart, doesn't like barrel down the door and say, hey, listen to me. I'm the voice of love and spirit and truth within you. It's very quiet. It's sort of like, okay, after you've listened to all that other stuff, all of that other ruckus, now, just be still for a minute and check in. What else is there? See, this, I think this is part of the mystery of God. And I think that God largely is a mystery because that which is infinite is not fully knowable to us here in, in Humanville. Right? We're not going to understand everything about something that's infinite. And yet it is ours to try and learn how to be in relationship with the infinite, to try and be in a healthy, loving, empowered relationship with this power that creates the universe out of itself, of which we are all a part. You know, in Native American spiritual tradition, it said that everyone has their own medicine, that you have your medicine, I have my medicine, and that is anything that improves um, our connection with the great mystery of life. So whatever it is that improves your connection. Remember, I remember um, a story years ago, I love this. I was at an event with Ram Das. You know, remember Ram Das? You know, I love him. And uh, I was at this event with him. I think it was down on Wilshire. And um, 
he's talking about these experiences he's had with mind-altering um, substances. You know, that he's had these big cosmic consciousness experiences um, with, uh, with these substances. And um, as he was talking, there was a lady, this little lady in the front row, uh, an elderly woman. She's wearing a little hat, has some little cherries on the hat, you know. She was like right from central casting, you know. We need, we need a little old grandmother type. Okay, put her there. And, and he's talking about LSD and all this crazy stuff. And she, uh, she's sitting there and she's nodding. She's nodding, you know. And, and at the break, he comes up to her and says, you know, ma'am, I, I noticed that you really seem to be in agreement with me about uh, these things that I'm saying about expanded consciousness and awareness and things like that. And she said, oh, yes, yes. And he said, well, how, how, because he's thinking like, you know, like, she doesn't look like she does LSD to me, you know, what's her deal? And, and, and he says, well, how, how do you know? How do you know these things? And she, she goes, oh, she says, I crochet. <laughs> Honest to God, this is true. That is this is true. I crochet. But see, that was that was her way in. That was the thing. You know, so some people go in the garden, or some people meditate, or some people sing, or some people go to the ocean and, and, and stare at the waves, or whatever. But her way in was that when she crocheted, she went to this other place. She went to her happy place, which sounded pretty good to me. Not, not enough to make me take up crocheting, but it sounded pretty good. So so whatever it is that improves our connection, excuse me. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, whatever it is, that was the bad choice. Whatever it is that <laughs> improves our connection to the great mystery of all life. So, so like I say, it could be time in nature. It could be when we meditate. It could be with our animals. It could be you know, in our own backyard looking at the flowers or whatever that may be. Another idea around this mystery is, uh, is that it is a truth that is unknowable except by divine revelation. Now, we believe in that. You know, that in the science of mind, we believe in the direct revelation of truth. You know, God, spirit, the infinite intelligence will reveal to us what we need to know. You know, science of mind says there's no mystery in truth. So what does that look like? God, show me what I need to know here. Spirit, reveal to me how I need to be in this situation. God, show me what has to happen here. I'm open. I'm willing. You know? And then if I don't try to project my will right after that, I have often found that what I need to know or who I need to meet just shows up in the baby aisle at Target. It's amazing. You know, in the science of mind, we believe in the direct revelation of truth. This is why it's so important that we become quiet, that we close our eyes and say, God, what do I need to know here? What do I need to know? Who's the person I need to be? How do I need to show up in this situation? I want to be my most conscious, my most loving, my most spiritually evolved self. Because I know, left to my own devices, I will do what's really easy. I will do what's familiar. I will do what's comfortable. But then I'm only going to get what I've gotten in the past. And what I want now is something of a higher order. I want something that's a little more light-filled, a little more loving. Because, you know, God is infinite, and, and we cannot know all of God but, but we get to know how, how it works, I believe. You know, I think there's also a mystery in, in faith that, that with faith, greater things are always possible. You know, but we are told that faith without works is dead. So faith necessarily involves some work, some effort on our part. You know, is, is, you know and I think I ask myself, gee, is that what builds my faith? The work before the demonstration, the work before the healing actually takes place. And for me, I think, yes, it is. You know, it's, you know, it's easy to have faith about things when you have lots of money in the bank, say. It's easy to have faith about things when everything's going well. It's easy to have faith in things when people don't disappoint you and they show up as the person you want to show up as. But what about the rest of the time? That's where we really, really need to have faith, right? And so what action do I need to take? You know, what, what steps do I need to take? Because faith comes, I think, from our belief and experience. You know, what, what do I believe about God? What do I believe about spirit? What do I believe about the world that I live in? What do I believe about other people? You know, uh, from, from that, I think we, we make decisions. And those decisions may or may not support us today, which is an interesting thing. Now, I would hold for every one of us that our faith has grown say, in the last year, in the last five years. I can't imagine it would stay exactly the same because consciousness that we are, the spirit that we are, is always in a process of evolving. So from, from what we have made, uh, uh, 
we, we may all made decisions, and those decisions may or may not be supporting us today. So that's why I think it's interesting to look in, you know, to check in and say, you know, what am I believing? And am I believing something that really serves me, that supports my spiritual growth, that makes me a more loving, compassionate person in the world? See, I think the spirit must be and is perfect. This is what Ernest Holmes teaches us in The Science of Mind. And that which is, that which is behind everything, back of everything, which obviously is God, has to be good. It has to be complete. It must be love and it must be harmony. And when we're out of harmony with some good, it's because we're the one who's off track along that particular line of, of, of life there. You know, so, so what I say all the time is that God is busy being God. Now, what am I doing? While God's busy being God, what am I doing? Am I recognizing that God is busy being God and everything is provided? Or am I complaining that things are not the way I want them to be? You know, metaphysical rule number one. Metaphysical rule number one. Emma Curtis Hopkins gave this teaching in the 1880s. Is don't complain is the way she said it. Now, you know I'd like to say it a different way, but I'm in church, so I'm not going to say that. But what she said was don't complain. Yeah, that is it. Um, so when we are out of, of uh, what I'll call paradise, right, what, what do I believe my relationship with God, with spirit, to be? You know, so, so it's easy to have a great relationship with God when things are good, right? We all understand that. But when things are a little more challenging, what's my relationship? See, now, what I know is that if we have some calamity in our life, then that does not come from the one perfect source of all. God does not send calamities. I don't believe that. It, that, that comes from within each of us. It comes from within our own consciousness. And yeah, I get off track in my own consciousness. We all do. We've all had experiences where we're, we're chugging along, and then before you know it, we've lost our way, right? And I'm thinking or believing something that is not spiritually true. I'm thinking or believing something that's actually not helping me. You know, how many of us know people, uh, certainly nobody here, but we know people where the thinking in their head is their worst enemy in life. Yes, that they just say things to themselves and they put themselves down and they don't believe in themselves and they have no faith in life, that what's going on in here is their worst enemy. Right? You know, and, and, and I have to tell you that because I also experience that, I, also, I, I can say in all honesty, I really hate that. I hate that. You know what it's like? It's like the sun is shining and, and, I, and I have stepped into the shadow. And I'm in the shadow, and I'm complaining about being in the shadow, and yet the sun is right over there. All I have to do is just take a couple of steps, and I'll be in the sun, I'll be in the warmth, I'll be in the light, you know, but, but I'm just, nope, I'm in the shadow. And I don't like it, and I'm going to complain about it to anybody who'll listen for as long as they will listen. See, if there's calamity in our life, what I know is that calamity cannot be truth. It is an error. It is an appearance. It is something that's claiming to be real. Excuse me again. You get how this is going to go, right? I mean, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's the, the calamity, it seems to me, is trying to gather evidence and agreement that it is real. It's trying to prove that we are separate from God. Now, the truth is that we are not separate from God, but we have very powerful minds. We have very creative imaginations, and we could really imagine that we are separate from God. But you know, one of the highest and most beautiful teachings that Jesus gave is Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. So if that's true, and I believe it's true because I don't think he was prone to saying things that were not true, if that's true, then this idea that I think I could be separate is impossible if already I and the Father, Mother, God are one. I think I have to set myself right in, in the universe, that I have to be, um, what I want to say is I want to show up as my very best self, you know, and what does that mean to me? It's, it's like, well, it's, it seems like a tall order sometimes, you know, that I have to do my best to duplicate uh, the attributes of the spirit in my daily life. I want to I want to do my very best at being loving and kind and peaceful and abundant. So again, I'm asking myself, you know, I'm asking us, what do I have faith in? You know, God, do I have faith in our fellow man? Do I have faith in the world around me? Do I have faith in the people I know and love? Because what we have faith in is what we're actually demonstrating, the science of mind teaches us. That those who have great faith, Ernest says, have great power. So it, Jesus also gave this teaching that it's done unto us as we believe. That's the law of mind as reported by Jesus. So I believe for each and every one of us that life is absolutely for us. Life is for us. And all the wisdom of our hearts knows this. Something deep within each and every one of us knows 
God is for me, life is for me. But I see what happens is that things don't go as we think they should. You know, we encounter the darkness of other people sometimes, we encounter our own darkness, and we get filled with fear. And, and I certainly understand. But fear is a negative use of faith. It's a belief that we are separate from God. And what did I just say? We cannot be separate from God. So we want a faith that is based on the knowledge that there is nothing to fear. We cannot be separate. You know, when we are convinced of the darkness, and how big the darkness is, and how real the darkness is, whatever form it takes, then we have no faith in that situation. And that's our job right there, to reconcile our faith. Why do I believe the darkness here is more powerful than God? Why do I believe the darkness in this person I'm dealing with is bigger than the presence of infinite loving spirit? See, I know, see, because I know what we say to ourselves. We say something like, well, I know this person is bad. I know this situation cannot improve. I know there can be no healing here. Wow, that's really limiting God. Think about that. Think about that. To say there can be no healing here. This situation cannot be better. The truth about this person is their darkness. There's no light in there at all. That's really, really limiting God. You know? um, I was thinking about this the other morning, and... I was thinking about when people, you know, when they go off, off the deep end in the bank or the 7-Eleven or wherever they are, I think they've forgotten who they are. They have forgotten that they are an expression of God, that they are the sons and daughters of the Most High, that they are here to express uh, the love and the light and the creativity that is within them. And I think when we don't know that, that's when people get really, really off track. You know how... So, so this, this person that I think is, you know, who's gone off the deep end, they are temporarily um, out of order, is what it is. They're out of alignment with the truth that is already within them that will make them more free. And I think this is helpful for us to remember. Because if all we do is join in with, wow, that person is crazy. Wow, that person is really bad. Wow, that situation is really messed up. Nothing's going to help that. No good can come from that. No good can come from that. And we're metaphysical spiritual students. We are serious spiritual people, right? And so our consciousness, how we lend our thinking and how we lend the content of our heart to those situations is very, very important. You know, um, we had a blanket drive uh, early this winter and some of the teenagers came to me after because they helped deliver the blankets. And this, our drive is we just go onto the streets and ask homeless people, would you like a blanket and a bottle of water? Okay. And... Um, so some of the teenagers said to me, oh, Dr. Mark, Dr. Mark, I delivered blankets. Oh, great. How did that go for you? They said, good, good. But you know, they, the people wanted to talk. They wanted to tell us their story. And I think, well, of course. Isn't that wonderful? You know, I hope you were patient and you were polite and respectful. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, so, so what did you learn? And they said, well, they, they, they said, we met a guy who went to Harvard. And I said, isn't that interesting? You know, I said, I promise you, they were never your age thinking, gee, maybe when I'm older, I'll get to be homeless. Wow. You know, nobody was thinking that, you know. And so, and so, so, this, so this was great. This was a really good teachable, uh, teachable experience, you know, because people are having the experience they're having. And, and I think it's, um, it's mine to not judge that, you know. I, I have no business in being in there being in there judging that. You know, you know what it's like when people say, well, I don't give, a, and I love how people do this, that, you know, they say, and, and you know, whatever you do, I'm going to trust that you are God-guided and directed. Really, I do. But people have to say, well, I don't give money to the homeless because they're just going to drink. And it's like, oh, really? Aren't you the all-knowing mind? You know, like, you, like, do you really know that? Do you really know that? Maybe, but maybe not you know, maybe they want a hot dog or a piece of pizza or something, and it doesn't matter. The thing is, if we're listening to our heart, we ask, God, is, this, is there something here for me to do? Is this mine to do? And sometimes you'll get a yes. This is something for you to do. And sometimes you'll get a no. But even if you get a no, the trick is to keep your heart open and keep the love flowing toward those individuals. Now, I'm just going to say that if I were homeless on the street, I'd probably want a drink, too. Tell the truth, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, I cannot imagine anything more miserable, more horrible than, than that. Yeah, I'd probably want a bottle or whatever of something, you know, multiple bottles, just to take me out of my pain, you know? And I think it's not mine to judge the, that situation. 
but it is mine. You know, this is why we're going to go on Good Friday and we're going to feed the homeless. Uh, we're going to have a little Good Friday lunch in North Hollywood Park. That we thought, well, rather than, because you know how many people have seen that there is an increase of, of people on the street? Okay. Oh, my gosh. And now, you know, it used to be everybody had a box. Now everybody has a tent. Isn't that amazing? There are tents. They have figured out that tents are a good thing. And I think, well, yeah, I'd, I'd certainly want a tent, too. Now, I don't think that it's mine to solve all of the problem of homelessness. But what I do notice is that when God brings something into my awareness again and again and again and again and again, it usually is mine to do something in that area, which is why I keep noticing it. I keep noticing it. And I can't just say, oh, this is so sad. This is so terrible. I feel so bad. Oh, this is so sad. This is so terrible. I feel so bad. Apparently not if I don't do anything about it. You know? And so my response to that is, well, you know, I don't know that I have the solution for the big problem. And our church does a lot of stuff in this particular area. But we decided, you know, I think the most intimate, personal thing you can do for somebody is feed them. You know, so that's what we're going to do. And I just think this is just another, another opportunity. It's not solving the big, big existential problems, but, but it, it will solve somebody's problem for that day. You know, for that day, we get to be a part of something that's a little more solution-oriented. You know? So when people go off, you know, when they go off the deep end, what I have to remember is that they are separate from the love within them. They didn't get up that morning and say, wow, I feel such love. I feel so connected to everybody. Let me get a gun and go to the bank. No, that's not what people say. You know, it's when people are disconnected, when they feel separate from love, when they feel separate from God, when they feel separated from life, you know, and they feel like they have no faith and no possibility, that's when things seem to really, really go askew. But you know, this divine urge within us is God's way of letting us know that we should push forward and take that which is awaiting our demand. That the universe wants us all, I believe, to have a full life. You know, so I believe if we really listen to our hearts instead of all that is fearful, all that separative thinking of the world around us, what we'll hear is that all is well. And what will be revealed, because we believe in the direct revelation of truth, what will be revealed to us is the next right thing for us to do. Let's pray. Thank you. So we turn our attention inward for a moment to just remember that we are surrounded and filled with God's infinite loving spirit. That God that is everywhere is right here where we are. The God that created the entire universe and galaxies and solar systems and also every flower we see on the sidewalk, that same God is present within us right now. And within every person here, in fact, every person on the face of the earth. And so I speak this word knowing and affirming that we are all connected in the mind and in the heart of God. That as far as God is concerned, all is well. And so we step into that awareness, into that thinking, into that experience right now. So I accept for each and every one of us, great healing is taking place. Physical, mental, emotional, spiritual healing. We say yes to all of it. And that where we have held something that does not serve us anymore, might have been a thought or a belief, an old habit pattern, some way of being, a way of thinking. If it doesn't serve us, we surrender it now. We let it go never to return again. And the way is made clear for more of God's love and light to express by means of each and every one of us. So we include in our prayer today our family members and friends, our parents and children, and we remember that right where they are, God is present, that God surrounds them, loves them, upholds them, is healing them. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So all of those things that pull at our attention, we remember that God is present right there, even in the midst of that, as all healing, as solutions, as perfect harmony, as the right outcome for everyone involved, because we believe in a God that's big enough to handle all of it. And so we bless our church, we bless all churches everywhere, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know we are blessed by being together, that there is raising up, there is healing for all of us. And so with a full heart, I say, thank you, God, that this is so. I release this word. And so it is. Together we all say, Amen.